COP26 is just around the corner. EV battery material stocks have been flying, led by the lithium sector. The EV sales have continued pushing higher and higher. Everybody's familiar with Tesla's recent deal with Hertz. All the discussion has been around this clean energy transition, the vote focus on decarbonisation as a society, and this mega trend that continues to emerge as we electrify the fleets and EVs are adopted around the world. There's a lot going on. You might be wondering, what does this actually mean? How can I get exposure through the portfolio? And what are the different materials and resources that may play into this decarbonisation theme moving forward? In today's episode, we're going to unpack it all. We're going to talk about five different resources that will be critical for decarbonisation, from lithium to graphite to rare earths, hydrogen and everything in between. We'll talk about these different themes and some of the demand drivers pushing these themes moving forward. And then we'll also use an example of one company within each of these sectors that can be a starting spot for you to go away and do your own research from. It's a fascinating time. We've heard a lot of discussion surrounding COP26. The Australian government looks like they've got an agreement ready to move forward to with net zero and nations around the world are really focusing on this transition towards a clean energy future. There's a lot of excitement. There's significant opportunities as well that may await and there's a lot of discussions about where we head from here. If you do enjoy the video, make sure you hit the like button. Feel free to share it out. We make daily videos. So if you haven't yet, welcome. Make sure you've subscribed and turn your bell notifications on so you don't miss any of our daily episodes. So up first, lithium. I'm sure by now everybody's familiar with lithium. We know that the ASX lithium sector has been absolutely flying. From Liontown Resources to Pilbara, Galaxy, Vulcan Energy, these companies have all become household names recently. What is lithium? We know it's a key component of high energy density rechargeable lithium ion batteries. It really is in the name of lithium ion batteries and so it's something that many people are familiar with. Of course, there's really two major sides of the lithium coin at the moment. You can either extract it from hard rock from the spodumene or through lithium brine. Of course, direct lithium extraction methods are starting to pop up now, though they haven't really been commercialized at scale yet, though these continue to grow and emerge. So it'll be interesting to see how new technologies emerge over this next decade and beyond. There's really dual sides of the drivers for lithium. It's a really fascinating dynamic at the moment. Firstly, on the demand side, we know that EV adoption continues to pick up pace. Electric vehicles are becoming more and more commonplace, and this is only likely to continue to accelerate as the lithium market tightens. But on the supply side as well, we know that there's a supply shortfall. There were many project cuts. We know that after the boom in 2017 and 18, there was a significant downtrend in lithium prices. So projects were either cut or mothballed and put into care and maintenance until the economics stacked up. So it meant that as demand has started to pick up and we got that price signal at the back end of 2020, there hasn't been insufficient supply yet to really feed into that. There was a really fascinating chart that's been doing the round. You can see it here on the right from Benchmark Minerals. Their forecasts show that the gap between operating mines and demand, so the shortfall between that in 2030, will be around 2 million tonnes of lithium carbonate equivalent. And this is five times higher. So the supply shortfall itself will be up to five times higher than the entire market in 2021. So it is huge. This really builds on some of the reports we've had come through from brokers like Macquarie, who stated we may be in a perpetual deficit for lithium. And of course, we know that building on top of all of that, the localization of supply chains is important as well. That's going to be a really recurring theme throughout this video for many of the different resources that we talk about. But it's prominent in lithium as well with a lot of the processing done in Asia and particularly China too. And so as we mentioned at the top of the lithium discussion, you really could take your pick about any ASX company that's been playing in the space so far, all the way from established producers down to the most junior of explorers. But a company that's attracted a lot of attention recently has been Lake Resources, ASX LKE. So they have a lithium project located within the lithium triangle. They've actually got four distinct projects, but their flagship project is the Karchi project. They're leveraging Lilac Solutions Direct Lithium Extraction DLE process. And they've recently formalized their agreement with them, which was quite a significant engagement. Their aim is to produce an ESG focused high purity battery grade lithium product. Of course, you know how important ESG focused offerings will be as companies, manufacturers look to bring down their embodied energy of the cars and any other products that they produce. And Lake Resources for a bit of a state of play at the moment are moving towards their DFS in the first half of 2022. They're continuing to work towards finalizing their financing with positive developments on that front. And they're currently undergoing a drilling program to potentially double production from around 25,000 tons per annum up to 50,000 thousand tons. It's a fascinating time. We'd love to know your thoughts. So drop in a comment below which companies you're interested in the lithium sector and how you've been looking to get exposure to it if you have or what your general thoughts are on where the trends will head moving forward. Up next, resource number two. This is a resource that's been getting a lot of headlines lately. Green hydrogen. 
At its core, hydrogen is a clean burning molecule. However, current processes emit CO2 and significant amounts of CO2. There are a range of different production processes at the moment. Grey hydrogen and brown hydrogen, either through steam methane reforming or through coal. But then there's also blue hydrogen now, which leverages steam methane reforming, but has carbon capture, so it doesn't emit emissions. But the reason why green hydrogen is getting so much time in the sun at the moment is because it's a process leveraging electrolysis, which utilizes renewable energy, which actually means the hydrogen that's ultimately produced has no CO2 emissions and then can be used to help to decarbonize a range of often difficult to decarbonize industries. This is interesting because if you think about things such as steel production or production of fertilizers, power generation, all of these are currently heavy carbon emitters. But if you can have a clean burning molecule like hydrogen to replace that, that's been produced, leveraging renewable energies, then it starts to be interesting and it can make a significant effort to help to decarbonize the broader society. Broad use cases for hydrogen are either burning it to produce heat, so of course it's got household or industrial uses, and then of course fuel cells to create electricity as well, which I'm sure you might have been familiar with. Currently, economics for green hydrogen haven't fully stacked up yet, which is why we haven't seen wholesale adoption, but there's been significant investment both at a private level, everyone's familiar with Twiggy Forest and the FMG pivot or transition towards a green hydrogen focus as well as the iron ore. But of course, government investment is continuing to ramp up as well as the broader discussion too. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. And so a company that investors have been looking at recently that may provide exposure to hydrogen is Province Resources. ASX PRL have acquired the Zero Carbon Hydrogen Project, which will leverage electrolysis, as we discussed earlier. It's located in the Gascoyne region in northwestern Australia, which is prime for renewable energy. So there's significant exposure to solar as well as wind, which of course is critical in the production of green hydrogen and bringing, bringing down the CO2 emissions that traditionally will come with hydrogen production. They're aiming to be Australia's first truly zero carbon hydrogen producer. Twiggy Forest has actually been buying tenements in and around the province resources tenements. So it's interesting and it shows that there must be some opportunities in the location at least. And they have got a range of other exploration underway as well, continuing across other tenements, including tenements that may involve or at least some early signs have shown potential for nickel and copper. So this is an interesting company. Onto the third resource, uranium. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the discussion recently that's been surrounding nuclear. What do we know about the uranium sector? Nuclear energy is actually a very clean source of energy generation. It's extremely efficient when compared to the renewables and significantly nuclear energy is baseload, which of course is a significant point of difference when compared to the current baseload energy, such as your oils or your gases or your coals, which emit significant CO2. After the uranium price crash, of course, which we saw on the back of Fukushima, a range of different other price signals, many of the mines went into care and maintenance because the economics didn't quite stack up for them. However, recently we saw the initial price signal set out by Sprott, who have released their fund and are starting to buy up uranium on the spot market. And this has really renewed interest in the uranium sector more broadly. Of course, we know that as the world transitions to renewable energy and a decarbonized society, there's still significant energy needs. And unfortunately, renewables aren't quite there yet where it can be used 100% of the time. So there needs to be a transitionary type of material or resource and many are potentially thinking that uranium may be a solution in the space. We've seen a lot of regulatory discussion surrounding it from Japan to the UK, Germany, China and even some early stage discussions in Australia. So it does look like the sentiment surrounding uranium which of course has been one major sticking point for the sector in the past is slowly starting to shift. So we'll see if this continues to evolve. And so a company in the uranium sector is Paladin Resources. I'm sure many people are familiar with ASX PDN. They were truly a uranium darling from the last bull run in the early 2000s. They were founded by John Borshoff, who's considered one of the forefathers in the uranium sector on the ASX. They've got a range of different resources, as you can see on the right here, but it's their flagship Langer Heinrich mine in Namibia, which really was their big cash earner during the last bull run and there's a lot of interest in if they can start to restart it moving forward. The restart cost is under $100 million USD it's been estimated at. Their C1 cost is actually under $30 per pound and we know that in the uranium sector a lot of the discussions has been around about that $60 US a pound as a magic number that producers will want to see on the spot market before they start thinking about bringing their, mark, their minds back online and where the economics start to stack up. It's an interesting time. We've seen uranium trading in and around that high 40s to $50 US a pound recently. So we'll see if this run can continue upwards. But of course, it's still in the early stages, but there's a lot of attention on it. On to number four, the rare earths. The rare earths are quite an interesting sector. They've got significant numbers of use cases, but many people are not actually familiar with what the rare earths are. Rare earths in themselves are actually relatively plentiful in the Earth's crust, which is quite counterintuitive when you think about the name rare earths. 
What it is actually is that the rare earth elements are typically dispersed, so they're not concentrated enough to mine, even though they are plentiful when considering the total global supply. We know there's been a focus on localization of supply chains around the world, and this is only amplified for the rare earths, because rare earths are used for a range of different use cases such as EVs, wind turbines, in defense, or for digital technologies. You can see a bit of a breakdown on the right here, but what you'll see as a common theme is that many of these are quite important for really areas and sectors of strategic importance. As a result of that, at the moment, the vast majority of rare earths are produced in China, and so the focus on localization of supply chains for resources of strategic importance are only amplified, and so this is why there's significant investment going on with exploration and looking for companies that can potentially bring on their supply moving forward over this next decade in the space. One company that's been flying the flag for the rare earth space on the ASX is Linus Resources. ASX LYC. They're actually the largest lead supplier of rare earths outside of China. They're the second largest producer of NDPR globally. So there's 17 rare earth elements. NDPR are the most significant ones and some of the ones that are in the most demand. And as we mentioned, there is that focus on supply chain resilience globally, and Linus is really hoping to feed into that. Linus Rare Earths have got operations in West Australia and Malaysia. They're also looking to expand into the US and have some preliminary discussions underway with the US Department of Defense. Of course, this is only going to continue to grow moving forward as we see governments as well as potential partners and uses of the rare earths want to supply and look to localize their supply chains. And as rare earth demand continues to pick up pace because many of the technologies are used in products that will be needed more and more as the world continues to digitalize and becomes more and more integrated online. And so on to our next resource, graphite. I'm sure many of you might have heard graphite thrown around, but you might be wondering how is it actually used and why is it often discussed in the same types of conversations as lithium? Graphite by weight, interestingly, is actually the largest component of a lithium battery. It's not actually lithium itself by weight, it's actually graphite. But graphites are traditionally used in the anodes. Graphite anodes are the dominant active anode material in lithium ion batteries currently. Of course, there's discussions about potentially silicon coated or solid state batteries, but they are still in the development stage and a while off. So at the moment, graphite anodes are still the most dominant active anode material. The anode are the negative electrode of a cell. They're associated with the release of electrons into external circuits. And what's interesting, graphite, like many of the other resources that we've been discussing today, also have significant production and processing at the moment focused in Asia and particularly China. So there's a range of different nations and regions around the world that are looking to onboard their production, really build out these integrated supply chains all the way from mine to production around the world. As you can see here on the right, graphite demand is likely to continue to grow moving forward over this next period. And because of the significant amount of graphite necessary to be within these lithium ion batteries, it's likely to be one area that's in hot demand over the next decade. And so that brings us on to Telga Resources, ASX TLG. They are a company with their focus of a mine to product integrated operation centered around their potential graphite anode facility and mine in Sweden. It's a vertically integrated end to end integration. If successful, it's still in the early stages, but they're hoping to build an EU source of battery anode and graphene additives. They're hoping to produce ultra low emission coated anode for greener lithium ion batteries and going from the graphite supply in their mine, which is a huge resource, bring it all the way through to graphite anode production. They have got a letter of intent with Mitsui and LKAB until the 30th of November, where hopefully, which will be over the next month, there'll be some more insights about potential partnership or some further discussions for that. And as well as that, they are still awaiting permits and approvals. So investors will be eagerly awaiting any more insights surrounding that for the ASX TLG story. And so then I guess the question is, what's up ahead? As we know, COP26 is arriving. Before we get into that discussion, if you did enjoy the video, don't forget to hit the like button. Feel free to share it out as well. As mentioned, we make daily videos. So if you're new here, make sure you've subscribed and turn your bell notifications on. We know COP26 is arriving. We know that there's a significant focus on this transition to renewable energy in all of its different forms, on energy storage systems to help to facilitate that. And of course, on the EV transition as electric vehicles increase their adoption further. There's a significant adoption both at the regulatory front, there's an accommodative regulatory environment that continues to emerge, particularly in a range of different regions, but more and more governments are becoming on board and realizing that the future is now. But there's also a significant amount of opportunity from the corporate and the private sector. And we're seeing individual companies and leaders really looking to heavily invest as this ESG movement picks up pace. 
COP26 is around the corner. There's going to be many discussions. It'll be interesting to see which sectors, which resources, and what types of discussions are highlighted as the most important. Who knows what it could mean for the share prices? Of course, we know that sentiment can drive share prices in the short term. And so discussions at COP26 do have the ability to potentially impact share prices if sentiment is affected. It's likely that we'll see discussions ranging from individual resources to different regulatory discussions to new technologies that may be adopted. It is very early stages and we know there's still a long roadmap ahead to 2050 where net zero has been discussed, but it does look like the right steps are slowly being taken, moving in that right direction. We'd love to know your thoughts on it all, so drop in a comment below. Thank you so much for joining us. We've done many videos into the EV battery material stocks as well, so we'll leave links to those up above that you can check out after this one. As I mentioned, I'm not a financial advisor. None of the stocks we discussed are buy recommendations. These are all just interesting companies that hopefully give you an insight into areas that you can start looking at as you look to explore the broader EV growth stocks and the broader renewable energy, clean energy mega trend. Thank you so much for joining us. Hope you enjoyed the video. For now, stay well and happy investing.